This homily is also available as a Marian News RSS feed at podcastgarden.com, iTunes, Google Play, and the parish website of St. Peter the Apostle in Wichita, Kansas. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well beloved spouse. Today I am not going to give a homily. I'm giving a sermon. All right? So get comfortable. Because what I'm asking us to do today is to be able to look at the last, what transpired this last week in our national capital. To take a look at what has gone on for two weeks, two months, three months. And I want us to be able to pray for the gift of wisdom that we might be able to see clearly. To read the signs of the times. And so we have to go back to history a little bit so that we might have greater clarity of sight. But again, still praying for that gift of wisdom. Let God infuse us with his eyes so we can see the world through his eyes and not our own. And so again, be comfortable, be comfortable here for a bit. I'm going to try and speed this up and get done before noon. So we have to go back to prior to our civil war and what's going on in Europe in 1831 to 1841. We begin to have in France in a particular way this uprising called communism. We have the publication of Karl Marx's manifesto and what have you and that's beginning to be published. So we have in Europe and it didn't affect us here in America so much at this time of course because we had the war pending, but we begin to see this uh, surgence of this notion of communism. And so I'm going to ask us to bear, bear with me for a moment as the church addresses this philosophical, political notion, because before we can see where we are today, we have to see kind of where this notion comes from. So Pope Leo XIII, uh, June 20th, 1888. He states, uh, paragraph 15, in his uh, document called Libertas. In other words, what is true liberty? He says, naturalists or rationalists aim at in philosophy that the supporters of liberalism carry out the principles laid down by naturalism and are attempting in the domain of morality and politics. So what does this mean? Liberalism, what we're going to find out, he's going to explain further, is going to be a certain notion, a way, a a worldview. He goes on. The fundamental doctrine of rationalism is the supremacy, supremacy, the highest, supremacy of human reason, which refusing due submission, refusing to submit, Refusing due submission to the divine and eternal reason, it proclaims its own independence and constitutes itself the supreme principle and source and judge of truth. Let's break that down. Because, again, we've seen the surgence of the understanding of our intellect and our free will and that we are free and autonomous. That is true. That is what makes us a human being. That's what makes us an individual with dignity and sanctity because we have the divine infused into us according to the Christian worldview. But what the the naturalist or what the rationalists are saying is that this view, especially of those who are educated, the elite, those who are educated that this view is supreme. In other words, it cannot submit to an outside or external authority. That the human mind is supreme, not the divine law, not natural law, not divine positive law, cannot oppress itself upon the free thinker. So this is where we get the word liberal, free, the free thinker, the liberal. But what the liberal is saying is that its thinking is supreme, it should not be under the construct or the oppression of an external law. He goes on. 
Hence, these followers of liberalism deny the existence of any divine authority to which obedience is due. And they proclaim that every man is the law to himself. Again, this is Pope Leo XIII, 1888. So the human being is going to become the law to itself. He goes on to say, and I, I got to keep moving so I don't want to quote everything here. But basically, if you get these elite minds gathered together, they are not going to only have a supreme law for the individual, but they're going to have a supreme law according to these collective of minds for society. And this, again, is where they reject external law or divine law, natural law, divine positive law, to be, they are not going to be oppressed by that. We begin to see what begins to develop is if I, if I want to do it, I choose to do it, it's okay. Or what we would say in modern times, if it feels good, do it. Now here's the great disaster. The great disaster comes and it's more explained in uh, Pope Pius XI in 1931, Quadrissimos Año, 40 years after uh, 1891. It explains, and I'm not, again, I got to keep moving, but it says it's going to give birth to two sisters. Liberalism will give birth to two sisters. And these two sisters are communism and socialism. The more dark sister is going to be communism. Communism, he goes on, and this is Pope Pius. Communism teaches and seeks two objectives. Unrelenting class warfare and absolute extermination of private ownership. So we wonder why, why, why is it that the United States is so opposed to communism? It's because those two things are like, ah, they're sacred to us. They're sacred to the founding fathers. So we're going to see a revolt against this communism. And, and again, he goes on. This doctrine seeks by violence and slaughter to destroy altogether. 1931, guys, 1931. All the more gravely to be condemned is the folly of those who neglect to remove or change the conditions that inflame the minds of peoples and pave the way for the overthrow and the destruction of society. So when the Pope takes a look at communism, we're going to see that it is all about, in this nutshell, it's about division, class warfare. It's about division to divide and to conquer. He speaks about, again, and, and this is paragraphs uh, 112, 114, 116. For the most part, they do not read. So, so then there's others um, who are saying that this is a violent, forceful overthrow of society and of the individual. And then he says, then he has the other sister. So communism is a little bit more violent, right? It's violent and it's assertive. The other sister's more benign but also more cunning. And that other sister is socialism. And he says, you know, for the most part, socialists, they do not reject class struggle. They don't reject it. They said, no, there needs to be class struggle. But only to some degree do they modify it. And so there's still this elite who has this supreme reason who are going to dictate to the masses, to society, what is going to be right, good, what ought to be done, what not ought to be done. The Pope also shows how there is a danger here. There's a danger that those who are Christian, those who are good, solid, rock Catholics, they want to be pulled into this socialism. And he warns us, he warns us, he says, no, he says, if you truly are Catholic, promote the gospel message, it takes care of those who are in need. He's going to say this more clearly, but to be able to say, look, you can win by Christian charity. And then also the free volition of getting people to free will to contribute to those who are poor, those who are in need. 
He goes on, whether to consider it as a doctrine or a historical fact or a movement, socialism, if it remains truly socialism, even after it has yielded to truth and justice on the points which we have mentioned about Christian charity, cannot be reconciled with the teachings of the Catholic Church because its concept of society is utterly foreign to Christian truth. Now, because is this, what is the, 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 the most important thing for the socialist is going to be the state. Whereas the church says the most important thing in society is going to be society at its most atomic level, which is not going to be the individual. It's going to be the most atomic level of a gathering of human beings called the family. So the Catholic Church is going to promote then society through the respect and the dignity of the family and also the members of that family, the dignity and the sanctity of each human life, the individual human being. So the state is not higher than the family or the individual. And so if we're going to address society, we have to address these two entities that the Catholic Church is going to hold sacred, that scripture is going to hold sacred. Socialism, wholly ignoring and indifferent to the sublime end of both man and society, individual and family, affirms that human association has been instituted for the sake of material advantages alone. Material. So socialism is going to say through this supreme reasoning of this elite, they're going to say that we have to distribute material wealth, material goods. Now in communism, they just take it, right? They take it by force. They take it by violence. But the Pope goes on later to say, he says, there is a subtle way that socialism takes it. Can anybody tell me, oh, I'm like in a classroom, no. Um, how does socialism do it in a very sublime, quiet way? How does it take away material wealth and, dis and, and, and redistribute it? Taxes. It does it through taxes. And the slowly chipping away, slow chipping away of the material wealth of others with force. Because if you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail. So socialism has this way of by force, not by violence, or you might say that's force is violence, but, but not by some sort of obvious or flagrant taking away of private property. It does it in a subtle way. The possession of the greatest possible supply of things that serve the advantages of this life is considered of such great importance that the higher goods of man Liberty not accepted must take a secondary place. And so the good of the family and the good of the individual comes secondary to the state. So again, I'm going to back up here. This rise of naturalism or rationalism gives birth to liberalism. Liberalism, which says that have you, uh, each individual has a supreme a supreme reason and does not cannot be interfered by something external like God's law and a gathering of those supreme intellects and the supreme elite cannot be imposed upon them an outside law like the Ten Commandments or God's natural law or the divine law he's going to say he's going to say then with that we have communism and socialism Communism is outright rejected because of the violence, but the Pope is saying socialism is more sneaky. It does the same thing, desires the same thing, but it does it in a slower way. He finally says, and I'll close with this, religious socialism, and that is trying to blend together Christianity and socialism, are contradictory terms. No one can be at the same time a good Catholic and a true socialist. So it emphasizes 
The church's respect for the family and the church's respect for the individual are paramount, superior to the state. Whereas socialism says the state is superior, these take secondary. I'm gonna close with that with the Pope's document and then now take a look at our society. If we have, if we have then, a notion of this creeping socialism into our nation and an elite who says their reasoning is superior to the Christian principles on which this nation is founded, there's going to be conflict with our constitution. There's going to be conflict with our founding father's thought. But ever so slowly, ever so slowly, it will begin to permeate into our culture. And what's strange here is that we see it permeating into our culture in a very subtle way, beginning in 1929, but in very specifically 1959 with the advent of the contraceptive pill. Now this is gonna sound strange here, because I'm making a leap. But with the contraceptive pill, there was basically a movement that was born that is free love, free sex. With this most sacred act between a couple, this most sacred act now became an act for pleasure and no consequence. It became an act that if you want to do it, do it. If it feels good, do it. And so now all of a sudden our society is permeated with this notion that there is no limits, no outside authority, no church, no commandment, no scripture can tell us how to run our bodies because we have the supreme intellect. So now all of a sudden the supreme intellect introduces a way in which we might have an action. The most intimate, sacred action of procreation is no longer procreative. With that, and paragraph 17 of Humanae Vitae by Pope Paul VI in 1968 responds to it. Again, the church is slow in responding. Paragraph 17 says, is you're going to see a rise in the collapse of family through divorce. Why? Because the intimate act, the marital act is cheapened. There are, if it's not life-giving or spirit or bringing about greater unity for the, for the couple. It's going to lose its fruitful purpose. Life-giving, love-giving. He also goes on to say that he proph prophesies. He says there's going to be an increase in divorce, the breakdown of the family, the exploitation of women. There's going to be rise in abortion on demand. And we see that just a few years later in 1973, Roe versus Wade where we have the permission, we have the law for the systematic termination of unborn children, which might be a consequence of the unbridled activity, sexual activity of free love, free, free sex. So herein lies the disaster. Once you open the sacred act to an action which is non, it is non-procreative, it's going to give rise to the L, B, G, G, T, Q, R, S, L, M, whatever movement. Because those are pro, non-procreative acts. So they have society then, because again of its free thinking, is going to be able to say, well, if we allow a non-procreative act here, we have to allow a non-procreative act here. So we have to accept homosexual union. So again, we're going to see then decline and this pushing out of a Christian culture. Let me backtrack a moment. Communism, socialism, cannot afford a religion that says there is an external law we have to follow. Whether that be divine law, natural law, divine positive law. It has to reject Christianity. So that which rejects Christianity is not of God. That which rejects the Judeo-Christian principles on which our nation is founded cannot be of God. And so this darkness of communism and socialism cannot afford to be open to any sort of Christian principle. So what we have witnessed over the last year, year and a half, almost two years, is a welding, is a fusing of both communism and socialism 
among a lot of young people in America. So liberalism gave birth to communism and socialism. Now we have an inbreed called Antifa, right? Where they will not permit a person of a different persuasion to speak. Where they will expend violence on anyone who tries to speak contrary to their principles or to their doctrine. Guys, this was formed from the 1840s. And we are living in it today. Now, Europe has already been succumbed to it. South America has been infused with it. But in North America, especially in the United States, we're still, there's still a little hope for the fight. So now, with those who are the free thinkers, what would be their greatest, in their view, what would be their greatest threat to their way of thought, to their way of thinking? I wanna pause here for a moment and thank the Knights of Columbus for being the probably the greatest instrument, the greatest force in the United States to shape their thinking. And how did they do it? They did it by the 3D imaging of a sonogram. The 3D imaging of a sonogram of a baby that 95% of the women who got a sonogram of their baby, 3D, digital or whatever you call it, 95% refused to have that abortion. The Knights of Columbus, through science technology, has blown a hole in their most sacred sacrament of this religion of infused communism and socialism, abortion. So any threat against their sacrament any threat against that which they hold most sacred is going to be a threat to the whole house of cards on which socialism and communism is built. So they must fight at every moment against anything that would oppose abortion on demand. Because if you compose abortion on demand, it's going to relook at human sexuality. If you relook at human sexuality, we're going to take a look at contraception. We're going to take a look at the exploitation of women. We're going to take a look at all this divorce rate. And the, and the liberals are so upset because millennials are changing the statistics of staying married. And you look at the liberal talking heads on the computer and you hear them say, this is not good news. That marriages are staying together longer in the millennials. I don't want to spout a whole bunch of statistics, but most of the, many of the millennials, 58% or something like that of the millennials come from divorced homes. And they have responded by saying, that ain't going to happen to me. And so their marriages are staying longer. They have a less divorce rate. So again... If we are able, through wisdom, take the Christian principles on which our nation was founded and allow them to be infused in our society, it shatters the darkness of the two daughters of communism and, and socialism. So I, I guess I, I mention all this so that we might be able to set up and say what has happened in the last 10 days in the Supreme Court hearings. Judge Kavanaugh represents every single threat to all the principles of this merged group called Antifa, he represents the greatest threat because he's pro-life, because he's pro-constitution, because he does not deny, he does not reject his Catholic faith and his Catholic upbringing. And he stands that there is a divine law, a natural law, a divine positive law that governs all civil law. And that is the greatest threat to this worldview of liberalism. So I am not gonna say, I'm not gonna say one way or the other, Kavanaugh, good, bad, ugly, whatever. All I know is that gentlemen, how many of you kept your calendar, or kept a diary since you're 14? <laughs> He's a nerd, huh? <laughs> I can't say anymore. That is just amazing. But he is principled. Whether we agree with it or not, he's principled. Gentlemen, I also say, because of this severity of his threat against the elite rationalism or liberalism, they have pulled out all stops because he is such a threat. So 
again, we take a look at America, we take a look at its founding, we take a look at our Constitution, we take a look at the founding fathers and their principles, and they are absolutely opposed to this elite socialism that we have in our world today. So again, I close with this. I ask us to pray that we might be able to have the wisdom, to give the, receive the gift of wisdom, to read the signs of the times, to read our world based in history and fact, to read the signs of the times and see why there is such a conflict, why there is such a fight, why there is such an uproar. It's because the very fabric of the house of cards of this darkness is going to be pulled by a person of the character of Mr. Kavanaugh. So I guess I, I wanted to emphasize this history so we can read better today. So I ask us to pray for our nation, that we might awaken in this, to see clearly, see more clearly the state of our union.